Isaiah 53 is the culmination of everything that the Old Testament scriptures spoke of. In Genesis chapter 3, we see that first mention of that coming seed. That seed is mentioned again when it is promised to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then to David, and all who would come after, that line of that seed. And now, because of Jesus Christ, we are grafted into that genealogy. Us, the Gentile world, the outcasts, the ones who had no dealings. The Gentile world was able to come to God, but it was through the way of Israel. Corporately, the nation had to join the nation of Israel. And through circumcision, that cutting of the flesh, they could enter into that covenant. But Jesus Christ is that one that makes that circumcision of the heart without hands. And now the Gentile world can come. The Jewish world can come. Whosoever will may come by way of Jesus Christ. And Isaiah, he, he starts out and he lists out all the things about him. I'm going to read down through this again. And where preaching breaks out, hold on because it's coming. Isaiah 53 starts out, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and, we shall, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, there's nothing about the person of Jesus Christ that our flesh will be drawn to. Nothing. Why? Because our flesh is driven by our carnal mind, and our carnal mind is enmity with God. What we are born with is this sin nature which leaves us the enemies of God. We have inherited that from the bloodline of Adam all the way down to my father. And I passed it on to my children. And they'll pass it on to their children and their children and their children as long as the Lord tarries and there are children born on this earth, that bloodline of Adam, that sin-cursed line is passed through the Father. We're going to be looking at the virgin birth tonight. Believe it or not, we're going to do it by way of 1 Corinthians 15. The Lord finally revealed something to me that I've been searching out for a long, long time, and I'm so ready and excited to show you. But that's just a sales pitch for tonight. <laughs> it says in Isaiah 53, 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. Oh, man of sorrow, what a name. That the Son of God should claim. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. This man of sorrows, the king, can you imagine that? The king of kings, the one true God. Not only becoming a man, but a man of sorrows, acquainted with our griefs. Do you realize that unless he became fully man, he could not be that full atonement? Unless he was acquainted with our griefs personally, he could not fully succor them who are acquainted with grief. The Lord has called a lot of loved ones home this year. And sadly, there's been a lot of lost folks who have gone into eternity, Christless. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That calling home. The grief that you fear, that you feel, and possibly that grief that you fear. Our Lord is acquainted with that because he's our high priest. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was tempted like as we are in all points, yet without sin. I said last week, I believe it was, that every single thing that you are tempted with in this life today, our Lord was tempted with. He was tempted with doubt. He was tempted with despair. He was tempted with lust and with anger. He was tempted in stepping out of the will of God. He was tempted with pride. 
And there is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. And that he will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. By the way, God will sometimes lead you to temptation to break you. If he would not lead us to temptation, why would Jesus tell us to pray, lead us not into temptation? God wants you to yield to his will for your life. He wants you to yield to his call to salvation. He wants you to yield to his law and repent. That's his will. That's his desire. We started out with that this morning. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But you must yield to his will and to his law. You're vexed by the devil? Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. It starts with submitting. Finding yourself lost. God's will is that you would bend. But if you will not bend, he will harden you with his cold until you break. He may have to lead you into temptation to finally show you what's in your heart. The way to salvation is not an easy one. Just as any mother in here knows, the way to that newborn babe is full of travail. But he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows. Acquainted with our grief, we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. John 1 talks of this. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. You realize that for many, many years, and even until today, the Jews are looking for a leprous Messiah. This word stricken refers to being stricken with leprosy. In Leviticus chapter 14, there was an offering that was, ma that was made. There was a dove that was brought, and one of them was slain, and the other dove was dipped in the dove that was slain and then allowed to go free. Jesus Christ was that dove that was slain for us so that we could be that living sacrifice and bear his blood to this lost world. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. One of the most, one of the most taken out of context scriptures and re referring to healing I've ever seen. You realize that physical healing is temporary. It's a stall. For it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. Our focus should not be on physical healing, but your spiritual need. What is God trying to show you in this sickness? Maybe he's trying to show you that you're still lost in your iniquity. Maybe you won't bend, so he's trying to break you. Maybe he's trying to show you that the chastisement of your peace was upon him. And that you can have spiritual healing by his stripes. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Iniquity is lawlessness in your heart. You don't care if there's a law of man. You don't care if there's a law of God. You are your own authority. This is an iniquitous generation that we live in today, including the world outside of these walls. I don't care what God's word says. 
because I know what it means. Have you ever said that? Careful. There's a lot of damnable heresies that are taught in the world today by well-meaning men. What does your Bible say? Not what you've been told it says. What does your King James Bible literally say? Because that's the Word of God. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. There isn't a single person alive today that is following God with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their strength. Not a single person. Not a single soul in this building is seeking God with everything that they have. There's none that seeketh after God. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Why? Because from the moment he was born to that time he died on the cross, he knew it was coming. It pleased the Lord to do this to him. For the joy that was set before us, before him, he went to that cross. You know what joy that was? When he was in that garden of Gethsemane and he said, not my will, but thine be done. If it's possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, let thine be done. You know what he had in mind? Peter on the day of Pentecost. Mary at the empty tomb. He had that Philippian jailer in mind. And Saul on that Damascus road. John on the Isle of Patmos. Philip on his way to work one night. My wife sitting downstairs in a nursery. He had you on, your, on his mind in that garden. He knew exactly what he was doing. And there wasn't a single thing on this earth, in heaven or in hell, that was going to keep him from going to that cross. Because he saw. He saw the ten thousands of his saints coming in glory with him to rule and reign in his kingdom. He saw you. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth because he saw you. He willingly took that cat and nine tails across his back because he saw you. He took the crown of thorns on his head. He took the nails into his hands and his feet. He labored for hours just to breathe on that cross. And he gave up the ghost for you. His soul was made an offering in hell. And he was your burnt offering in the flames of hell for you. And he came back from the dead by the power of Almighty God for you. By his resurrection, we are justified. And that's why, at this Christmas time, we remember Easter morning. Listen, if you don't know what new life in Christ is, if you can't look at your life and say from the point where God was in you and to now, and from before he was in you and before is different, you need to seek him today. He may be working to draw you. He may be working in you to bring you to that point where you realize it wasn't that prayer you prayed, that you still need to be born again. It isn't that you've served in the church for a hundred years. It's that you need to be born again. Oh, but I've taught Sunday school class. Yep, I did as a lost man. I preached from behind this pulpit, lost. God was merciful to me, a sinner. He was long-suffering. He wasn't willing that I would perish, but that I had come to repentance. 
And he finally showed me what I was on the inside. I had put up such a barrier against him on the outside. I had whitewashed my tomb so good it looked so nice. I even learned how to tie a tie right. I'm telling you, I, I, looked, I looked the part. I cleaned my lips up. I, I hid everything. Not from him. And then one night, he finally broke me and I yielded to him. And he saved me. And if it wasn't for Christmas, that could have never happened. If it wasn't for that cross that we sang about, or the, the cradle that we sang about, if it wasn't for, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. If it wasn't for asking, what child is this? If it wasn't for that little town of Bethlehem. There would be no joy to the world. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb before the slaughter. He was taken from the prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he is, was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. He was sinless. He was perfect. There was nothing that he deserved that he received. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul... For an offering for sin, you shall see his seed. You know, when he was there on the cross, in that instant of time, right before he gave up the ghost, he saw you. He saw his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Satisfied. Can you imagine that? God the Father looking on his son dying and going to the fires of hell for a wicked worm. Are you satisfied with that? But that's because he knew the righteousness of his son. That's because he knew the boundlessness of his love for you and the riches of his mercy. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us every single day, every single moment for the rest of eternity. Amen. Do you realize you still live in iniquity? You still have presumptuous sins. I don't care how long you've been born again. Do you know why? Because our flesh has not been redeemed. Our spirit and soul have been bought back from Satan. From your father, the devil, to the heavenly father. By the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And is that blood which is still powerful today. There is nothing but the blood that can cleanse you from your sin. What can wash away my sin? Not just the things that I do, but who I am. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Do you realize God didn't have blood? until he became a man. God didn't have blood until he became a man. And that blood had to be perfect. And so it came through a virgin. If you were to take a blood DNA test and you tested every single male on this earth from Adam until the last baby that was born just right now, it wouldn't match a single one. He had a heavenly father. Unfortunately, there are a lot of false Bibles out there today that make Joseph his father. Be cautious of that. That virgin birth is so necessary. Amen. We're going to talk about that tonight. Come back, please. Not just for my sake, but for your own. 
the well-being of your family. That sacrifice is something that can't be under-told. The magnitude of Christmas Day cannot be, cannot be overstated. Every single soul from Adam to Mary herself was looking forward to that coming Messiah. Inside them, they knew they needed God. He was the light which lighteth every man which cometh into the world. He's got his light shining in you, drawing you unto himself. If he's brought you to the point of repentance and you have truly been born again and there is a changed life inside of you, he's still drawing you closer and closer to him. Cleanse your hands, O you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. James wrote that to Christians. There's things between you and God, Christian. There's things you willingly let in your life because you're justified in your actions and in your doings. Oh, my bitterness, I'm justified in that because I've been, I was molested as a child. My heart goes out to you. I know your pain. It wasn't your fault. But it's what God has allowed in your life to bring you to him. I'm justified in my bitterness against God because everything that he's allowed into my life. Be careful there, friend. Be careful. Bitterness is a root that will spring up and it will defile many. I'm justified in my affair because my husband never really loved me anyway. Justifying yourself is a sure way to spend eternity in hell. You need to be justified by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Be careful of that bitterness that you're holding against everyone. That hatred, that pride. Be careful of that friendship with the world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. God cared enough about it to send his son. That's what we're celebrating here today. Isn't it amazing that the king of glory would take on sinful flesh? The likeness of sinful flesh. We understand he had no sin of his own. The scriptures are very clear about that. But isn't it amazing that he would humble himself like that? And that me, the worst of sinners, could be a partaker of the king of glory. That he would no longer be an intruder in my life, but my Lord, and my Savior, and my King. That the riches of his glory would be shed abroad upon me, unrelentingly. That his love would flow full and free through me so that I could love the unlovable. Isn't it amazing that we would gain an interest in his blood? The Christmas season is one of joy and happiness for most. There are some who will be sorrowing this Christmas and my, my heart grieves with you. Please know that I love you all. I don't know every intimate detail of your life, but I know some of you are hurting right now, and I'm sorry. But God doesn't ever let a tear fall from your face, but that he doesn't have a plan for it. He's doing something with it. Jesus Christ himself, it says in Hebrews, that he was made perfect through suffering. Why would he do any less to the rest of his children? because he knows that's what you need. You're learning to trust him, child of God. You're learning to find him sufficient. You're learning to see that even when we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. My heart 
And my hope and my aim for today was that we would see Jesus Christ glorified. We would remember the real reason why we celebrate here, coming to Christmas. That we would get a, a little bit of a glimpse of, of what the scriptures point to and, and why we sing the Christmas carols and what they mean. I'm very thankful for the leading of the Lord and how God arranged all of the verses and, and brought everything together today. And I'm very thankful for my salvation. Without Christmas, I, I wouldn't have it. Without Christmas, I, I would have nothing. I'd be lost and black with sin. But because of Jesus Christ coming as a babe, living a lowly and sinless life, and dying a, a terrible, violent death, I have everything. 